Thank you. Okay, so we basically almost, I mean, we basically finished with our discussion of linear maps with the hardest subject, it's the hardest topic or the hardest material in relation to linear maps. It's this uh, matrix, idea of the matrix of a linear map, especially when you do it with respect to the basis different from the standard basis. Today I just have a set of examples where I just repeat the same technique over and over again for you to have extra practice. You will have even more practice in your tutorials, but after that we will close the subject of linear maps and then we will move on to the next chapter, probably next lecture. And that will happen probably next lecture. So the first question I'd like to discuss with you today is two tutorial questions. The first one is the question 60. It's two questions on the same slide actually, 60 and 61, because they are related to each other. I will do both of them on one single slide. They're not, full, they're not long solutions. So the question says, take say identity map, take say identity map, the one which takes every vector to itself with no alterations. And I, I take a very simple setting on two-dimensional plane, identity map. Uh, I hope it doesn't, doesn't cause any trouble when I claim that this is a linear map. So it is obvious, it will be a subject to the two requirements on linear map, little a, little b, little a and little b requirement. Uh, the question 60 actually asks for, a met, for the metrics of this linear map. Okay, and question 60 even says just take the standard basis in R2, two elements in that basis exist. Take this standard basis and find the matrix of this linear map, identity map, with respect to this basis. It's a very simple question. It, even on the computational side, you don't, you don't have to do much. But it shows you the, I'll, I will do this question in a way which shows you the structure of this algorithm we discovered with you on, in the two lectures, two preceding lectures. I'll, I'll do this in, in, I mean, I'll do this in trying to emphasize this algorithm. So. This is standard basis in R2. I need to find the matrix of the identity map with respect to these two, with respect to a couple of the standard basis. So the algorithm we discovered with you on, on last week, it says this, we need to apply my identity map. We need to apply the map in question, in fact. In particular question, we'll look at the identity map to each element of my basis and then find the representation of the result in, term, in terms of this basis again. So you see, I apply my identity to the first element of my basis, E1. The result will be E1, that's the nature of identity map. And then I produce the representation of my result, E1, E1 vector, as a linear combination of elements of my basis. Nothing can be easier, just, you just take one here, you take zero here. That's my representation. For the second vector, I do the same, the same process. I apply my identity map to this vector. The result is E2. And then I just make up this representation of this vector E2 in terms of my basis, E1, E2. And again, guessing these coefficients, nothing can be easier, just 0 and 1. And then the process, I mean the algorithm, the general procedure, tells me that all I need to do now, I need to collect these two. These two numbers as the first column of my matrix, and these two numbers as the second column of my matrix. And we come up with the answer that the matrix of the identity map with respect to couple of standard bases is identity matrix. These two numbers, they went into the first column here. These two numbers, they went into the second column here. That's all there is to this question. Now, question 62. Any questions, please? <clears throat> Nothing can be easier. There's no any heavy computations in this question. All you need to do, you need to follow the, the algorithm to the letter. The algorithm we discovered with you last week. So, the second question, 61, it says this. All right, so we look at the same map, the same identity map between two planes. Right, but this time I suggest different set of bases. I suggest we'll take first set of first basis is this B with these two vectors, and the second basis will be C 
with these two vectors. And the question goes to ask, what is the matrix of the same identity map, the one which takes vector x into the vector x, but this time with respect to a different couple of bases, b and c, rather than s and s. Algorithm is the same. I need to apply my map to every element of my basis in the domain. This time b is the basis in the domain. And then I need to find the representation of the result in terms of my basis in the co-domain, in terms of the C. So I think, yes, I introduced letters to abbreviate my writing. So the, these two letters will be V1 and V2. In my further writings, I will use these abbreviations to make things a bit shorter. These two will be W1 and W2. Okay. So if I follow my algorithm, what it says, look at this. I need to apply my map, which is still identity map, to each element of B basis. That's the first element. I apply identity map to V1. The result is trivially V1. That's the nature of identity map. And then I need to find the coefficients which make the representation of this result in terms of the C basis. This time I can't guess the coefficients from the top of my head here. I could because of the simple structure of my basis. Here, these coefficients, I no longer can guess them from the top of my head. I will need to do some computations to find them. But structure-wise, that's, that's the same structure of this addition. Then I will need to apply my identity map to the second element of my basis in the, code, in the domain. The result will be trivially v2. And then I need to find another two unknowns, which will make this system of equations work. Uh, if you remember uh, last week when we had the similar similar setting where we needed to solve two systems of linear equations, that's one system, with two unknowns, that's another system of two unknowns. And uh, as a side comment, the indexing I chose for my unknowns, it exactly emphasizes the fact that these two unknowns, they will go as a column of my, as a first column of my, my matrix, and these two unknowns, they will go as a second column of my matrix. But now we have these two systems, the augmented matrices of these two systems, they are, again, symbolically, if I write this symbolically, that's the augmented system, uh, augmented matrix of my system. Left-hand side is a matrix which, compo which consists of W1, W2 as columns. Right-hand side is the V1. This is the augmented, augmented matrix of my second system. Left-hand side, again, W1, W2 as columns and V2 as the right hand side. When you solve these two, it is, will be efficient, it will be efficient if you solve them simultaneously, so you actually you build one single augmented matrix with W1, W2 on the left hand side and V1, V2 on the right hand side, and you solve this one, just, just, just this one. That's the reason I did this, I introduced these symbols, because this line this line and this line, if you write them with actual numbers, it will take a lot longer to write. It will take more space on your pay, on the paper or on my slide. But this time has come now to go back to numbers. So this has made this huge augmented matrix. Numerically, here it is. W1, W2 from here. V1, V2 from here. I need to solve this. That's again, it's, it's a row echelon form. I have pre-computed the row echelon form. I have pre-computed the reduced row echelon form, as a matter of fact. Here it is. Here it is. So from this reduced row echelon form, we can extract my solutions. I can extract the solution for the first system. I can extract my solution to the second system. In fact, when you do this extraction, you will look what, what you need to do. For instance, if you go for the first system for the first two unknowns. The right hand side which corresponds to the first two unknowns, V1, it was the first column here. So the corresponding right hand side in the row echelon form will be first column here. So if you are unknown, if this is your left hand side, this is the right hand side, if you solve for your unknowns, first will be a negative one, the second will be two, the second unknown. So in fact this first column of my matrix is it's already as a column here. 
and th this is my second column of my matrix. So the whole right hand side is in fact the matrix we're looking for. Yeah. Even though I said T is supposed to be, of course, identity identity matrix on R2. And that's the answer to it. Quite different, isn't it? Uh, I mean, quite different to my to the question 60. See? And that's the answer to the question 60. This is the answer to the question 61. And that this reflects the fact that bases they have significant influence on the result. We kept the map unchanged in the question 60 and the question 61. On both occasions, the map was very simple and the same all the time, identity map, but we changed the basis and the result has changed significantly. Look at this. The matrix of my identity map, I say it again, identity map still, well, the one which take X into X, no changes. With respect to this new set of bases, is no longer identity matrix. Any questions? Good. Okay. Uh, I have a few other maps to discuss with you. On each, in, for, for each of those maps, we will find metrics of those maps. But uh, the maps themselves, they have some geometric, uh, geometric origins. Uh, the first one is the projection map. It's a question 20 in the yellow book. So it's a map. Uh, it's a question 20. Uh, I get, well, the picture here is So it's a geometrically it's it's a projection map T. This T will be a projection map, the one which takes so it takes vector A into this red one. So you fix to you fix the vector B, this blue one, and then for any other vector like A, you can find the projection of this A onto B, this little red one. This is exactly the projection. You take another another A like this. You can still project it, the result will be here. You can take A like this, you can project it, the result will be here. That's a symbol we, not, we often use for this projection. It's a map, isn't it? It takes a vector, A, and produces another vector, this red one. So it's, 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 it's some, some sort of a map. In fact, you can extend the... I mean, this is a two-dimensional construction, I mean, on this graph, or on this picture, sorry. I showed you the plane construction, but in fact, if you remember the formula for that projection, I mean, for this vector of projection, we have a direct formula. Here it is. All you do, you take a dot product between A vector and B vector, you divide by the length of B squared and multiply by B. Or scale by, oh, oh yeah, you take B vector. That's, that's the formula for the projection. You, oh, I expect you remember this formula from the first semester. And nothing actually stops this formula from working in actually any dim uh, in dimension higher than two. That's why I said, in principle, you can construct such a map in Rn, not necessarily R2, as on the diagram. Well, now we're going to look at this map from the point of view of linear maps. Now we study any linear maps. This is a map, and in fact, it is a linear map. I don't know if you ever checked this. I'll check this for you. To convince everyone that this is a linear map, you need to check two properties of linear maps. The, 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 or linear maps, that's right. Those which I call little a and little b property. So here's a very T is a linear map. That's my claim. If I check a, I need to apply T to a sum of two vectors, say x and y. And that's the formula, how I do that. I need to replace this a with the x and y. Here's a replacement. Now I need to say that it's a dot product here. For the dot product, we have distributive law, meaning that we can expand brackets in dot products as if, like, we, in a similar way we do it with numbers. So here's my expansion. If I expand these brackets, it's the first, uh, it's the expansion here. 
Now, if I expand the bracket, uh, sorry, sorry, if I expand the quotient, even so, if I divide these two by itself and these two by itself, and then if, if I use the distributive law of scaling on vectors, that's what I will have, and this, these two, just the formula for t of x and t of y. This is a verification for the first requirement on a linear map, requirement A. Again, I, I say this many times. It's another opportunity for me to say this. Every time you prove something, you borrow something from the past. Here, the borrowing happened first here, when I said we use the distributive law for dot product. And the second step, which was like actual contribution for our bag of knowledge, was here when I divided each of the elements in the numerator by the denominator. And then I split this across, I mean, B vector also get distributed. So it's a distributive law for scaling of vectors. One of the axioms, in fact, one of the axioms of vector spaces here. I, I used here one of the axioms from the vector spaces. Very similar check or verification works for the second requirement of linear spaces, which says I need to apply my map to a scaled vector, say lambda rex. This is the application. I just substituted lambda rex here in place of A. And now I start taking, I start using knowledge from the past. The first knowledge I'm going to use here, that the scalar can be taken out of dot product. And then I can recognize in the second factor here, I can recognize the formula for the projection. This is a place where borrowing happened, borrowing or like a usage of the tools from, from the past. Okay, so now I hope I convinced you that this is a linear map. So we can apply all of the analysis. We, we, we know for linear maps, one of these analyses is matrix of a linear map. So we may, we may ask a question, what is the matrix of this linear map? Uh, yeah, that's right. We can ask such a question. In principle, we can answer that question in a very generality, in terms of this symbolic vector B. I mean, I didn't specify what, yes, I didn't specify what the B vector is. And I hope you understand that this map, it's not one map, it's actually the whole family of maps. If you change your vector B, you will find another linear map. So this T, in fact, it depends on the choice of B. You change B, you will come up with a different linear map. So in, you can, in fact, reflect this in the notation by introducing subindex like this. Mm. Yeah, I can, I, I'm not going to do it all the way through because that will make the, the writing a bit heavier than it is. But once I can do it, I can reflect this dependence of on, on vector B in my notations. So. Like I said, we can, because we know it's a linear map, for every B it's a linear map, we can go after metrics of this linear map with respect, say, standard basis. In principle, with some effort, you can recover this, the formula for such metrics in terms of B. Yes, you can, and maybe I'll show it this, this formula for you a bit later. But in terms of like practicing, it doesn't make a big difference. So I will, I will I'll choose one single example. Let me just say we're looking at three-dimensional case, and my B has this particular numerical value, 1, 0, 2. In fact, it may be a good exercise for you to do, to try to recover the formula in a, in a, in a, in a very generality, when B is the n-dimensional n-tuple with components B1, B2, B3, Bn, and find the formula in terms of this B1, B2, B3, Bn. But I'll do it just in, the, in case of this random choice of three-dimensional vector. So I say we don't just go standard basis. Let's just make it simpler. Forget about other choices of basis. Yeah, that's right. If I want to find the matrix of such linear map, B is like this, S, uh, the basis is this, I need to follow the standard steps of finding the matrix of the linear. I need to apply my map, this map T, to every element of my basis. So I need to apply my T to E1. And for that, I need to follow this formula. So what I do? I take the dot product of A and B, actually, of E1 and B, and that will make it 1, first component of my B, then divide by the length of B. Length of B is 1 plus 4, 5, 
I mean root square, and then multiply by b vector. So here, here it is, 1 and 5, and then b vector. I just follow this formula directly with no any diversions. Then I apply my t to vector e2. I claim this will be the result. I just double check. If I take the dot product of my e2 with b vector, it will be second component of b, which is 0. So I agree with this, actually, 0 vector. And t of e3, my slide claims that the result is this. Let's just double check. I use e3 here in this place. The second, the third, sorry, the third component is 2 on 5, which is still length of my b vector, and then b vector itself. It is done. The first stage is done. We applied my t to every element of my basis. Now I need to express each of these results as a linear combination of my basis again. Given that we're looking at the standard basis, I don't need to do any row or chicken forms. It just, that's, the, that's the beauty of dealing with the standard basis. In fact, these results will be the columns of my matrix. So I claim, I claim that the T matrix with respect to a couple of bases S and S will be just collection of all three vectors here as columns. That's the collection of them. And one and five here. Let's try. <coughs> and this is the answer. Okay, any questions? It's not really a hard computation. Like I said, you can make an attempt and discover the formula for the matrix of projection in terms of symbols. If your B is not just some random numerical choice, but B1, B2, Bn. In fact, I have a slide where it is done, and maybe I even show it to you today. Uh, I'm just thinking, what's the time? Yeah, why not? We can we can have a look at that. Yeah, let, let's just let's just let's just do something similar. Um, once again, any questions in relation to the projection map and the matrix of the projection, which is fun. Okay, then then there is a closely linked map with with geometrical origins, uh, closely linked to projections called the reflection map. It's another example of geometrical example of a linear map. Uh, that's where we can do the general considerations. In fact, that's a question. That's question. Sorry, twenty. I searched question eighteen. I'm surprised to go in the other order in the book. Question eighteen. That's the projection. That's the reflection map. So it's it's almost identical diagram to the one which you just saw. Uh, so, but this time you take your somehow I change the notations to p. Well, you take your vector. I call it p this time. Uh, you you have your other vector. So rather than projecting, you just take it further to the other side of the line, and that's the result you produce. So this this red one, this red vector, is a projection of p onto g. But this is a result. Where's the ah, here you go. This red one, the Q vector, that's the, uh, that's the reflection of P with respect to G. That's another map with geometrical origins. That's another map which has link, uh, some links, in fact, very direct links to projection. And again, if you alter your P, if you take another vector like this, again, you can project, and the result will be here. For any other vector, you can, you can find the uh, reflection with respect to the D line. So it is a map. In fact, it is linear map. So let's just look into that. So we look at the map T now. As before, as before, you can reflect in the notations that this is a map which depends on D. Oh. You can reflect this in the notations. I only do it once because if I just do it all the time, it will take too much time. As before, you can come up with a direct formula for the result for this Q vector, which is a reflection. That's the formula. You can do it like this. First, you project, and then you add one extra here. So look, look at the formula. The Q vector, which is, a, which is a reflection, what you do is this. You take the projection vector, one of these, 
and then you, you add, I hope you remember how we add vectors geometrically, you add another stretch of this vector to it. And the stretch of this vector, it's the difference of, that's right, it's the difference of the projections, projection and the original P. So this is a formula for, for the reflection vector. If you expand the brackets and if you combine things, it's the same formula, a bit simpler, a bit simpler looking. So my reflection as a map, that's what it does. It, take, it takes P vector and returns Q vector according to this formula. Yes. Again, I claim this is a linear map. And this time, the justification for the claim even easier. All you need to say here is this. Your, my reflection map is actually double of the projection map and take one of the identity maps. Because we know when you combine linear maps, when you combine linear maps with sum and scaling, the result will be a linear map. That's all you need to say in support of the claim that the reflection is a linear map. I mean, the... the the weight of the argument is, of course, here that we prove that the projection is a linear map. Again, we can raise the question, what's the matrix of this linear map? So T is a linear map. I can raise the question, what's the matrix of this linear map? Again, I will use this numerical choice as before, 1, 0, 2. However, this time, and as for the first time, I'll do, it, I'll do it the other way. I mean, every time we were looking after a matrix of a linear map with respect to a basis, this time we look at the standard basis, this is a basis, we follow very strict algorithm. We apply the linear map to every element of the basis, and then we, the results, we found the representation of the results of this application in terms of the other basis, or sometimes it was the same basis. This time, for the first time, I'll do it differently, and that will be another tool in your toolbox when you go after the matrix of linear map. Look what I'm going to say. I'm going to say this. Yes, I need to find the matrix of this reflection map, but given this connection between the reflection map and the two other maps, one of them is a projection map, and the other one is the identity map. Given this connection, now I can say that the, why can I say that? What just happened to this? It looks like I lost it. Oh, no, it's, it's here. I'm sorry. <laughs> Given this connection, I claim that the matrix of my T with respect to my basis is double of the matrix of the projection map take the matrix of the identity map. This is something I never proved, proved to you in the, in, the gen, in the general setting, and that's probably unnecessary in the, in the, in the current, in the current uh, topic. But this is something you allow to use. In fact, if you build a new map as a, as a combination of other maps, for which you know matrices, the matrix of this new map will be the same combination of the matrices of the original of the map of the maps involved in your in your construction. Provided, of course, every 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 matrix involved is found with respect to the same set of bases. You can't really change bases, of course. You can just take here one couple of bases and here another couple of bases. Given that this one, this matrix we know, we found this first, first example today, we found this matrix, uh, identity map with respect to the standard basis that will be identity matrix. This one we just found with you on my previous slide. All I need to do, I need to combine these two matrices in the, in the right order. So I'll just, this is a reminder from the slide before. Uh, matrix of my projection map with respect to the S and S couple is this matrix. All I need to do now, I need to double this I need to double this matrix and subtract one 
identity matrix from it. It's the result. If I double it, will be two, oh, across the matrix will be twos, and then I subtract identity, given it's one five, I need to subtract two, uh, five as the result. Two of these take five, negative three. Nothing changes here. Two of these take five is negative five. The rest of the row is the same. Two of these take five is three. The rest of the row is the same. This is a matrix of the reflection. You may find it useful actually to try to find the same matrix with the direct approach, where you apply the reflection to every element of the basis and find the representation of that in terms of the, I mean, the results in terms of the basis. But this is a useful trick, actually. If you know that your map has some connections, like this, to other maps for which you know matrices already, you can combine those matrices with the same relation, and you'll find the matrix of your new map. Any questions? Okay, like I said, I chose this particular vector on both of these examples just because to, to make, like, a, to take this complexity of general, uh, general argument, unnecessary technical complexity of the general argument away from the, from the presentation to make the structure more exposed. On the other hand, if you just take the general vector, if you take a general vector G with symbolic components, G1, G2, Gn, it's not really that, that far from the current solution. The, uh, the answer will not be that far from the current solution. In fact, I mean, the matrix for the, uh, the matrix for the projection in the general setting and the matrix for the reflection in the general setting. On this slide, in fact, I have the answer with, with, some, with, uh, with some argument. I'm not going to discuss it today. I will upload the slide, but I strongly encourage you to do it on your own. Figure out the answer in a symbolic case. I mean, figure out the dependence or figure out the formula for this result for the matrix of reflection and matrix of projection in terms of the components of general and dimensional G and tuple. Any questions? Okay. If you don't have any questions, I have another map with geometrical background, which also a linear map, even though maybe you haven't seen it that way before. And that will give me another opportunity to try to show you this method of finding the matrix of a linear map. And that's the map, which is a cross product. This is another question from the yellow book. It's a question 30. So it's a map which works particularly in this setting between two R3 spaces, from R3 to R3. This is the formula for the map. So for every vector x, what you do, you just cross product it with a, with a fixed vector b. Again, as before, that's the, the whole family of maps. So you can reflect this in the notations. It's the whole family of maps. For different Bs, it's a different map. But I think it's sufficient to, re to reflect this only once, and then for the rest we can remember it. It is a linear map because it is subject to two requirements, A and B. That's a simple verification for that. That's how you check a requirement. You just say if you apply your t to a sum of two vectors, x plus y, that's the application of the formula. Here comes the step where I borrow something from my past knowledge. I know that the cross product, similarly to the dot product, it's a something which is subject to distributive law. I can distribute my factors like this. And in each of the terms here, I can recognize my t map. So the result is this. This is simple verification for the A requirement of the linear map. And that's the step where we use something from the past. I 
I can check B requirement of, of a linear map when I apply T to a scaled vector. Again, if I use my knowledge, some my past knowledge of cross products, I know that this scalar can be taken up here, and that's the result. So T is in fact linear map because the linear map question of a matrix becomes relevant. There's no new, you can't really find a map uh, oh, you can't find a map of a, of a map which is not linear. There's no such a thing. But for the linear maps, question of a matrix is a, is a legitimate question, and we can find in this case we can just in this case give us another opportunity to do that. Here it is. Uh, this time I'll do it symbolically. At least for the, for the for the first half of the slide, so I give symbols, I give symbolic names to the components of my B vector B1, B2, B3. Again, I'm, I will do it for this with respect to the standard basis E1, E2, E3. I will follow the standard algorithm once again. So I apply my T to the first element of my basis T of E1, and here is the computation. Our cross products. How do we compute that? We build this, we build this uh, informal determinant, isn't it? It is informal because the first row consists of vectors. So, strictly speaking, this is not it's not illegal to, to write something like this, because determinant is it's, it's taken over matrix with numerical components, numerical entries. But we do it this way because it just helps us to remember the formula easier, isn't it? So that's the formula for the informal way to remember the formula for the cross product if I actually compute this formula what do we do we take e1 with this minor which is zero then we take e2 with the minor which consists of these two elements that's a b3 and then the e3 minor is this one that's the computation for the t of e1 t of e1 is this vector T of E2, T of E2, it's again cross product, but this time with vector E2. This is the informal determinant, which gives me the, uh, uh, give me the chance to find this cross product. Again, I need to use the row decomposition for this informal determinant. And the result which I have pre-computed is this result. That's right, because you take this E1 and this smaller determinant, which one, the one which is negative B3. Then you take E2 gives you zero because of these two zeros. And E3 gives you this minor or smaller determinant, which is B1. So that's, this is the result. Final computer. So you see sometimes finding the matrix may be even like a, even if you don't need to do any row or children forms, it, it can be quite involved, like quite, quite long. In this case, we won't be needing any we won't be needing any row echelon forms because because we need to represent the results as a linear combination of my pages, and in fact we have done it so already. So here's my last computation, T of E3. That's the informal determinant which corresponds to that. And this time pre-computation tells me that the result is pre-computation tells me the result is this, right? Look at this. E1 comes with this minor determinant, smaller determinant, it's a B2 value of this. E2 comes with these two smaller ones, and that's the B1, but E2 normally comes with the negative, that's why it's negative B1. And E3 comes with this zero. Yeah, everything is correct here. Okay, so all we need to do now, we need to collect these coefficients as columns, right? Because stand, uh, the, the general procedure says the results must be expressed as a combination of bases. They are, they, we have done so already in the course of our computation. So my matrix becomes, look at this, TSS. Here it is. First column in this matrix is a set of these coefficients. Second column on this matrix is a set of these coefficients, and the last column on this matrix is a set of these coefficients. 
this is a matrix of the cross product as linear map in the very generality. See, it depends on the choice of my B, but it, it, is, it is the matrix we were looking for. Like I said, similar thing you can do for the other two maps, for the reflection and, and projection. Any questions? Okay, actually, I'll, uh, in, in, on my slide, I take this a bit further, just to show you one, one interesting thing about, the, about this result. Uh, and as far as uh, what I will do, actually, I'll make a numerical choice again, just to make the exposition a bit simpler. So I'll just make a numerical choice, one, two, three, for B. If I make this numerical choice, my matrix, that's the numerical matrix I have, it's just from the from here. Uh, I have taken this matrix to row echelon form. I, I have pre-computed that. Is a row echelon form of this matrix. And you see what I you see what happens with the row echelon form? We have a non-leading column. We have a non-leading column here in the row echelon form, meaning that my matrix has a non-trivial nullity, non-trivial null space, right? The nullity of my matrix. Oh. The nullity of my map is one. I don't know if I said it ever before. Nullity, bef well, we, we certainly discussed with you nullity and ranks in relation to matrices. This slide actually tells you that these two ideas, these two concepts of nullity and rank, you can take them to maps themselves and you take them through matrices. So you see, I claim here the nullity of T, and I claim T is a map, not a matrix, and I claim it through the matrix. So the nullity of a linear map, it's the nullity of the matrix of that map. Of course, this statement implicitly assumes that if you go for the matrix of a linear map, you can do it in different ways. Right? You, can, you can do it with one basis or the other basis, this, this claim implicitly assumes that no matter with respect to which basis you find the matrix, the nullity is not going to change. Like identity before. Remember the, the first slide today, we had identity map, the same map, but we found two different matrices for that map, depending on the choice of a basis. Well, the claim that the nullity of a map is the nullity of the associated matrix, this claim implicitly assumes that no matter which basis you take to find the matrix, and of most, most of the time you will choose the simplest choice, the standard basis. But even if, if, even if you choose some other basis, the nullity is not going to change. So nullity is independent, unlike the matrix. Nullity of a linear map is independent of the choice of a basis. It's a deep, it's a, it's a deep claim. It's a difficult result, as a matter of fact. But for what, what all that is required from you is to remember this result. And the same applies to rank as well. The rank of a linear map, it's the rank of the associated matrix of a linear map. And again, this number is independent of a choice of a basis. The matrix is dependent on that. Rank itself and the nullity are not. Well, anyway, the nullity of this map and the matrix is 1. We can actually find the null space. And I think I go that length. Yes, that's right. I actually I solve for the null space here. How do you normally do that? You parameterize the column or the unknown which corresponds to the non-leading column. Uh, that's right. So here's my, I just say x3 equal t. Then I solve for the rest of the unknowns, say x2 from this line. If I solve for x2, this is a solution for x2. If I solve for x for x1 from this line, this is a solution for x1. You can combine this into a vector form. That's the combination. I combine this solution into a vector form. This is a combination. In fact, given that we're dealing with fractions here, if I rename the parameter, if I introduce this parameter, s, which is t on 3, my solution in a vector form will look even nicer because we no longer have any fractions involved in the answer and this is the answer surprisingly 
surprisingly. So we see what happened, the null space of my, the null space of my matrix and the null space of the associated map T is, look at the original B, numerical B, and look at this one. Looks like it's the same. In the remaining few minutes, do you think it's coincidental or there is some deeper reason for that? That this, we, we found the matrix before in general terms, in terms of the B1, B2, B3. I made this numerical choice for B. I found the matrix for that. I found the nullity of that matrix and the null space. Here it is. It's a span of B itself. So the null space, in fact, null space of T is, in fact, span of that's what we just figure out isn't it the null space of my linear map turns out to be a span of my b vector do you think this is a coincidental or there is a deeper reason for that can we claim something like this without making a numerical choice can we claim something like this in the general circumstances when you have b1 b2 b3 what does your intuition tell you Yes, no, it's a 50-50 chance. Any ideas? Any brave people? How many people think it's coincidental? Can you please raise a hand? Okay, how many people think this is this is a there's a deeper reason for that? Can you raise a hand? What 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 the rest of you thinking? There's no any third option. Okay, of course there's a deeper reason for that, otherwise I wouldn't focus on this so much. That's one of the one of the explanations you can come up with. You can find an easy explanation in the geometrical origins of your map. Those which I basically left, we will left them. Far behind, we just discuss all the matrices and null spaces and row echelon forms, and maybe that was the good strategy because you forgot about these origins. But if you look back at the origins, here, this origin explains everything because null space. What is it? The null space is the is a collection of those vectors which are taken to zero by your map, and the cross product. What do we know about the cross product? When cross product is zero. When the vectors involved in the cross product are collinear, isn't it? That's what we know about the cross product from other studies, from the geometry, from our knowledge, which has no bearing or no, no connection with the linear maps. It's the that's again it's it's a background. It's our toolbox. It's our past knowledge. We know from there that the cross product is zero when the vectors involved are collinear. So if you now just use this fact and you just reframe this fact in terms of the spans and the null spaces, you see that the null space of this map must be all vectors collinear to B. And this collinear, in my new terms, is a span. So in fact, this, this identity, you knew it well beforehand, before we just started discussing cross, cross products, because you knew that the cross product zero when vectors are collinear, you knew that we just all we did we just put this into this new language language of linear maps and language of spans any questions no all right thank you very much we done today <laughs> thank you